Hi, this is Dr. Deborah Moore. I'm here with Dr. Temple Grandin. We're talking about our book, Navigating Autism, Nine Mindsets for Helping Kids on the Spectrum. And today we're talking about the ninth and final mindset, which is how do we envision and how do we prepare kids for a successful adulthood? And a couple of really important points is that you can't wait until the very end and they suddenly are out of high school and they fall off a cliff. And another important point is that a lot of kids aren't prepared with daily living skills and some kids are way too deep into video gaming and that can really uh, derail a young adult. You know, there's some social skills that kids get with the games where they talk to each other, but you've got to limit it. You can't be doing it for eight hours a day. One thing that helped me was a slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. Um, mother got me a job when I was 13 with a dressmaker. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. I uh, had a little sign painting business. Kids, when they're younger, you know, like maybe, you know, selling some candy for charity or something like that, or, or Girl Scout cookies or something like that. All of these kinds of things teach really important social skills, learning how to handle money, shopping, also, you know, staying away from home. I went to boarding school, so I think that was helpful. But um, before the kid graduates from high school, you know, maybe go to a sleepaway camp. Mm -hmm. So they get used to not living at home. Mm -hmm. I remember on my very first night in a hotel room, it was Holiday Inn in Greeley, Colorado, and I was gonna visit the Montfort Feedlot. Mm -hmm. So excited about it, really nervous. But it was one night. Right. You right. work into it gradually, doing things like that. And okay, for let's kids, say somebody's going to get their own apartment. Well, yeah. maybe you have them spend some few nights at a hotel to get just get used to not being at home, so it's not such a big shock. Yeah. And for kids who are going to live in a um, any kind of a residential facility where there's staff and, and so forth let them go there and spend one night to try it out before you make the commitment. Let them get used to it. Uh, we have an example of that in the book uh, of a girl who, it just didn't work the first time and it doesn't always work the first time, but she didn't even realize that she wasn't coming home. She hadn't been prepared enough. And that can happen also for kids who um, intellectually are able to go to college so many times they don't make it because the supports haven't been put into place and they've never maybe gone over to the college and walked around the campus, things like that, where they get more comfortable. Well, you see, it's not having a surprise. I, when I was a teenager, I was afraid to go out to my aunt's ranch and mother gave me a choice of a, a week or all summer. And one of the things that helped was talking to Ann on the phone uh, seeing pictures and things of the ranch, you know, if you can visit a place. So it's not such a surprise, a gradual transition. And then even when I was in graduate school, I was like building up my sign painting business more and more. And then gradually that morphed into livestock design. I was writing articles for the magazine. It um, happened slowly, a gradual transition. Now I'd like to have the world of work transferred to before they graduate from high school. Right. Two real jobs before they graduate from high school. Make sure you don't put them on heavy multitasking like the McDonald's takeout window. That'd be a horrible uh, first choice. Uh, it's, but I want to also emphasize it's never too late to start. Let's say you've got the video gamer and uh, there's been three success stories where they've been transferred over to auto mechanics very slowly. Mm -hmm. And they found out that they liked it because that's the visual thinker tends to get addicted to the video games. And you do it gradually. You gotta wean them off the video games. And you replace it with something else. And if they're playing those games where they talk to their friends, you um, allow a certain amount of that. Uh, where it's solitary video games, I'm gonna be even more, be really negative about it. Yeah. And the ones where they talk to their friends, you have to, you limit it. And what I just talked to one parent, she had a flood, they had a budget of time for each week. And if they wanted to play some big video game tournament, on Thursday, they could use up their whole week's budget in that time. Mm -hmm. You see, and that's teaching some budgeting so they can still do that game where they socialize. 
And the solitary games, that I want to eliminate, I want to, I want to reduce them a whole lot more and replace it with something else. Uh, but um, because being a recluse in my room, that was never allowed. When I was away at the boarding school, I didn't study, they didn't care that much about studying. But when I didn't want to go to movie night, because I was nervous, they made me the projections. I had to go to chapel. I had to attend the classes. Was not allowed to become a recluse in my room. They were very, very strict about that. And that also was really helpful. Yeah. So getting stretched out into the environment, even if you didn't want it, as long as it didn't have a lot of surprises and you had some information, it was doable. No, and the most of the things that I didn't want to do, it was not sensory. It was just anxious. Right. You get just anxious. You just you want to isolate yourself because that helped reduce the anxiety. You know, the other the classes and things like that, there was no sensory issues. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, now something with some people with huge sensory overload, that no, you wouldn't do that, but that wasn't the situation. Right. You were, you were getting... And then also the the social training I had as a child helped me um, get my freelance sign painting business started because I'd go up to people and show them my portfolio. And I was doing that as a teenager, way before the cattle stuff started. But your mom had taught you, I remember, to um, greet people at the door. Yeah. And it's not all that different, going up and showing them your signs. Exactly. Well, when, when, in our neighborhood, when kids were seven and eight, this was a thing that was done in our neighborhood, that's when parents had parties, and every family has parties. And uh, you put your best clothes on, and you were little hosts and hostesses. You greeted the guests, you took their coats, you chit chat with them, you'd serve the snacks. Obviously, we didn't serve alcohol, absolutely not. But um, that's not hard to do. That can be done in any family. But I, I think a lot, a, lot, a lot of parents don't do that, though. They, they, they think, my, my child's too anxious to do that. My child won't know what to say. What do you say to those parents? Well, let's start let's not have the huge, huge party where it might be a lot of noisy overload, like a gigantic tailgate party, football game or something like that. Um, let's just start off, you know, a couple of friends are gonna come over for dinner and they're gonna greet them. And you've kind of tipped off the friends because yeah. they, the my parents' friends, when they came over, they knew to talk to the kids. And then after the cocktail hour, um, then at the dinner itself, we were told to get lost. Yeah. Then the grown-ups wanted to do grown-up talk. But for about at least half an hour, 45 minutes, you know, we were passing the uh, snacks around. And, and my brother, who's not autistic, admitted that that helped him advance in his job at a bank because he was comfortable with talking to older men. Uh -huh. So even for my brother, that you definitely did not have autism, it was helpful. And it's right. not a difficult thing to do. It right. doesn't cost anything. You adjust it to the child. Yeah. And I'd start out with a small party maybe first. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just a couple of friends over for, at first. Right. And then you expand. And also in terms of predictors of success as adults, we look at the research and we find that having an actual paid job is really important. If you can't find one, volunteer work is a good alternative. But if you can find an actual paid job where a child has to show up, and it's not a family business, it's an outside business, that's a huge predictor. Super, super important. And the other thing is look for back doors into jobs. I always ask parents, do you know somebody owns a shop? And they go, no. And then when I kind of dig into it, they go, hmm, someone's got a little insurance office or they've got a florist shop or um, I, and I go, yeah. And, and I, I warn them about the multitasking, the jobs to avoid and uh, store chaotic stores at, uh, during the holidays is not the time to start. And you just have to, you can just find it in the neighborhood if you just look. Yeah. It's really true. Maybe we can end by talking about uh, a concept that you refer to as a pilot's checklist, because that can really help a child, what, whatever is, they're learning. 
well, let's just say the job was at McDonald's. Uh, we're not going to put them on the takeout window. We'll have them work an easier shift. Um, and they've got to tear down the ice cream machine and clean it and put it back together. That would be the kind of job where you give them a pilot's checklist, the tear down steps, the cleaning steps, the reassembly steps. Because this is where bosses get really frustrated. They go, well, all right, Sean, I do that ice cream machine like two times. Is he stupid? No, they need that pilot's checklist with the keywords for each step. That's an easy, easy thing to do. And when I was a graduate student, I worked in a dairy and they had a pilot's checklist on the wall of how to set up the dairy equipment. And that was really important. Um, simple thing to do. Long strings of verbal instruction do not work. You cannot be vague. Okay, let's say it's stocking shelves. Tidy up the shelves, that's too vague. No, you need to say that each, okay, let's say they're in the shampoo and the toiletries aisle. Um, okay, each product has to be lined up with the correct price tag on the front of the shelf. And then you show them. You see now that's being specific. Right. So there are actual steps that you can take that are going to really make a difference. Um, what the odds are that your child's going to succeed. At well, and I would, you know, pick a quieter kind of um, environment. The other thing I see on the job thing is I see a big problem with making a differentiation between what bagging groceries is a training job, maybe for one summer. And where bagging groceries for another person with maybe some intellectual challenges is a career. Right. This is a very, very important distinction. You know, there's a lot of people that need to go on something else. Mother had the kind of feeling when she got me to go out to the ranch that she needed to get me doing something beyond the boarding school where I was at. That's one of the reasons why she was so anxious to get me out to the ranch, get me exposed to some other new things. Well, thank goodness she did. We've all benefited. So we have talked about each of the mindsets in navigating autism, and we hope you've enjoyed it. Temple, it's always good to talk to you, and we will talk later. <laughs>